we we'll start with some general updates, just uh, a little bit about some upcoming events. Um, then John Schmidt talking about his put away project clinic. And then we'll wrap up with coast modeling. So just wanted to cover two upcoming events. Somebody's got a mute in the background there. Oh, there we go. Um, so two upcoming events. Um, September 29th, we'll do our South Bay meet at the South Bay Railroad Historical Society. We're going to try to get back into a regular cadence of a South Bay meet and then something in the North Bay probably in March. And I'm looking at potentially doing something up at the um, you know, California State, uh, the, the uh, Railway Museum um, in Richmond. Um, I think they're the uh, the model railroad museum there. They have some space. We could have at least some morning clinics, and that would let us have some yeah, afternoon layout tours in the North Bay. Um, basically, in the what would be essentially our winter meeting then. Um, and then, of course, we'll have an auction in December, on December 8th. Um, so right now we have three clinics planned um, for SBHR RHS. Um, Seth, Earl, and Richard are going to do a, a clinic talking about detailing a scene that they are doing, um, have been doing on Seth's layout um, based on a pure prototype um, in the Fremont area and uh, redetailing that into the, uh, into the scene on the layout. Um, David Gibbons is going to either do his rolling stock check-in process or talk about wheel weighting, um, some interesting things there. And then what we're going to do in the back room, this will be in the boardroom, we're going to have Frank um, do his new updated weathering clinic. And if you haven't been, had a chance to see that, it's really a great opportunity to see a number of techniques for doing weathering, et cetera. So that'll be in the morning. Um, we'll have a lunch provided, thanks to the PCR. And layout tours in the afternoon, and those will be available probably in the next week or so, which ones there'll be. There'll be a few layout tours in the afternoon. And then December 8th, we're going to do the coast auction at the Alameda Senior Center. So with that, I'm going to stop and throw it back to, to Jan to uh, to go ahead and start his, his clinic for us. Okay, Phil, one quick question. Uh, yes. You, okay, you said you are uh, thinking about doing one up at the Golden State Model Railroad Museum. Is that March? That would probably be in March, exactly. Okay, I'll bring it up to them. I have yeah, that's exactly. It. it was. I mean, the thought process, just so everybody understands the thought process, the thought process was to have four events. Uh, the auctions, really, it's easier to do them in a place that we understand and that works, and I think the Alameda Senior Center works. Um, the downside is the long trip for the people from the South Bay. Um, but that's kind of the challenge there. Um, the other two events, one the idea is to do one in the South Bay and one in the North Bay. And I think, you know, doing them at clubs where they have a space where we can do a clinics and do a couple of clinics in the morning works really well. And, and the Golden State has a great room out in the front. I know we've done the OPSIG there and, you know, some other things. So hey, I know yeah. it's a, a challenge for them, though, to get it cleaned up. So you can do that because it's always seems to be full of a lot of stuff. Don't worry, we'll welcome you. So I'll, I'll just bring it up. I have a board meeting in about 45 minutes, so I'll talk to them about it. Cool. Hey, Phil, another uh, quick question for you for the event on September 29th. I think Earl might have mentioned to you with uh, Pete Cressman's passing, I'm, I'm, I'm helping Gabby try and uh, liquidate some of her stuff. Yes. And I think he mentioned maybe setting up a, a table at the. Uh, the uh, abs absolutely. Um, and, absolutely. And I mean, I'll just I think bring it's... down some stuff and lay it out and see what people might yep. want to pick up. Um, we'd set it up either there in the back or set it up outside. I, over on the right, I know they've got an area. They generally have some of their stuff on it, though, but we'll figure out something. Okay, well, I'll talk to you offline about that. Maybe. Yeah, no, and we can figure it out when we get there. You know, just we'll, you know, I think we're planning on getting there just right around eight forty-five ish or so, and the clinics will start at ten, so we'll get ten to eleven, eleven to twelve clinics, and then have lunch at noon, and then have layout tours from one to four. Okay, so that'll kind of be the run of the day. So obviously, lunch might be the best time in some ways. Is that's when everybody will be there. So cool. Well, with that, I will throw it now over to, to Jan and uh, 
and welcome. Welcome from the, the cold North Bay, I guess we should say, uh, <laughs> way, way up in San Rafael. Uh, so this is, I, I think, a very interesting break. And I'm going to throw it over to you and, uh, and let you have the stage. Okay, thanks, Phil. Let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. If it's in the mood. So, so hey. by the by the way, I'm going to mute everyone real quick, and and let you. You're going to have to unmute yourself, John. So there we go. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Go for it. Okay. Great. Okay, gentlemen, thank you for uh, asking me to uh, present today. It's kind of fun. Uh, this is a um, discussion of, let me see if I can't move this out of the way. Yeah, there we go. Uh, discussion of what we did for Paul Weiss's uh, Central Vermont Railroad up in, up in Novato. Uh, COVID hit. We basically shut down every, all the team activity on the railroad and uh, stopped work sessions and so on. And that that um, got us to a lot of thinking because guys would go in and do, you know, individual projects and that sort of stuff. Um, but we have been running the railroad using JMRI operations for all the car movement and uh, been pretty strict about that. Uh, so. Um, we did know that it was going to be a while because of COVID before we restarted the formal sessions, but guys wanted to, you know, move cars around and maybe run a train or something like that. So we agreed basically to suspend all of the uh, JMRI operations rules for car movement and let the cars move where they would. So during this downtown, we, we upgraded the railroad. We, Change tracks, clean tracks, scenery, putting in stuff. We got, uh, uh, we changed the railroad so that it'll look more like the prototype. And as I mentioned, the prototype, actually, did I mention the prototype? I haven't. I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, but we used the time individually to work on the railroad and to, uh, you know, make it better. So after a while, we decided it would be safe to start working together on the railroad. But how do we put the railroad back together? Cars were all over the place. They were not in their original locations. Um, they didn't have any relationship to where JMRI thought those cars were sitting. Um, so how do we put it back together? And at the same time, you know, this they're all have been down for a year, and uh, it was not in operable condition, quite frankly. Dirty wheels, dirty track, turnouts. Uh, you know, some of the guys went and put in, you know, ballasted track, and of course that always uh, affects the electrical. It affects the turnouts and so on. So we tried to figure out how do we bring the railroad back to life. Now, the Central Vermont is a big railroad, 35, a 30 by 40 foot building plus an annex. It represents the Central Vermont uh, in 1956 from New London to Brattleboro. 700 cars, 100 inter, uh, industries, interchanges, large yards, large staging. And then we have built from the beginning JMRI operations controlling all of the car movement. Here's the uh, lower level of the central Vermont. Uh, that uh, ENL yard, which starts in the upper right hand side and wraps around the entire um, west side of the building, is, uh, is a major challenge all by itself. Um, then the railroad climbs out of that. Okay, ENL, of course, is East New London, climbs out. Uh, from East New London and goes up into uh, Palmer and uh, Willimantic and into the uh, the North Staging area, which represents Brattleboro and uh, points north on the on the Central Vermont. So big railroad, and this doesn't include the annex, which is another moderately large room 
which uh, takes off from the upper right corner there and goes into a large staging yard and now a very large industrial area uh, in that room. So how do we bring the Central Vermont back to life? The requirements, clean and test all the rolling stock. Clean, test, and use every piece of track, turnouts, et cetera. Put the cars back around the railroad equitably. So the railroad looks like it's in balance, getting ready for, for new operating sessions, new official operating sessions. And importantly, make sure that JMR operations and the railroad are in sync. So the JMR, JMRI operations knows where every car is. And in the process of doing all this, I wanted to minimize my own keyboard time, um, uh, just uh, very selfishly here. So when we talk about JMRI operations, uh, the, the rules are the JMRI schedules. Uh, so every industry on the Central Vermont has a schedule which talks about all of these factors, the car type, the load it receives, the load it ships, where it ships it to, et cetera. And currently we've got 67 schedules with 269 rules. So these, this is what determines what car goes where, when, and when, how long it stays at an industry, and then where it goes in its next step. Uh, if you haven't looked or haven't used the MRI, it's a really, really powerful um, software system to to run your railroad and make it make it operational uh, in a prototype manner. So, putting the railroad back together, what are the options? Well, we could hand pick up the cars and put them back into where they were last time before all of this happened. Uh, that would be uh, painful, number one, but it also doesn't test the cars, it doesn't test the tracks, uh, and also we did change some of the trackage. So some spurs got shorter, some spurs got longer, some spurs disappeared, some spur spurs got added, and the same thing is true for cars. Uh, cars were added and some were removed. Um, wrong era or the quality of the car or we just didn't like it whatever so this this option was not a valid option um, second option is to newly place the cars across the industries still requires lots of hands but the big problem is that it requires checking each car against the schedule for that industry so if I'm going to take a car and, and drop it into an industry, does that industry take that kind of car? And uh, that would be manual checking if we did that. And it require a lot of data entry to tell JMOI where we put that car. So this is a, the screen for setting various things about a car. And basically, you, for each car we moved by hand, you have to set the location and the track for that car and the load for that car. Uh, so I wasn't about to do that. So we want to make sure that the car matches the schedule for that industry. So what was the solution? have JMRI operations place the cars. So to do this, we took all the cars from the industries and interchanges and put them in work areas. And so that basically emptied the railroad, uh, except for those work areas. And it was a great time to clean all the spurs and make sure all the turnouts uh, were working because basically the industries and the spurs were, were empty. So we decided to clean and test the cars in cuts. And that's a totally arbitrary um, designation. Um, take a group of cars, 
give it a label and keep that group together, keep that cut together until it's actually put away. And we keep we kept manual switch list to uh, to list the cars in each cut. Each cut got a road test with a full pass to the main line. And we, we made repairs to those cars as needed. So this way we in fact ran every car around the railroad, cleaned it, checked it, fixed it if necessary, and the cars got healthier. So we eventually had 44 cuts. And as I say, the cuts were arbitrary. So some of them were as small as four cars. Some of them were as large as 20 cars. Uh, depends on whoever was, quote unquote, responsible for that cut. And the cuts were in various places. They were in various places in staging um, and uh, the major yards, that sort of thing. So all of these cuts start out in staging or a yard. Um, and then we told JMRI to put them away. And how did we do that? We set up two virtual staging locations, a, a track called Arrive. And when we first started the project, we put every car in this Arrive track virtually. And that's basically you know, a one clip under JMRI. You select all of the cars and you move them all to the Arrive location. And then we set up a depart location which will hold one cut and in fact, one train at a time. And again, that's select the cars and a click to do the set that all those cars into our quote unquote in the depart track. So cut by cut, moving the cars to the depart track, we then had set up two JMRI routes and a route under JMRI tells uh, the trains where it is going to be working uh, at each town. So we, we built two routes which cover the entire railroad, uh, Distrib North for a northbound train and a Distrib South for a southbound train. And of course, because some of our, our industry spurs are directional, uh, in fact, most of them are directional one way or another. Uh, we needed both a southbound train and a northbound train to do the work. Now, the other thing about a route is that you see um, there is a move column. So as JMRI would populate a town, we could set that town to have zero moves. So JMRI would not put any more cars in that town. So if it filled up uh, East New London, we would set the moves to zero. If it filled up ENL North, we set the moves to zero so that it would gradually populate um, and under control all the way up through all of the towns. So accordingly, we set up two trains, uh, DS for the southward, train using the Distrib South uh, route, and DN for the northward train using Distrib North. Um, and again, these are working with the two virtual locations. Actually, they're working with the one virtual location, which is the depart track, which is a virtual track, but it's the depart track. So basically, we would virtually move a cut to the depart track. And then we would build the train under JMRI operations, one click. And that creates the manifest for us to, to use for that train. And that manifest, of course, tells us what car goes to what spur. And then we'd hand that manifest to one of our guys and he would actually physically run the train. And again, this, uh, by physically running it and uh, running it intelligently, you're using the trackage, you're using the turnouts, you're using the locomotives, you're using the cars, 
you're using the spurs. And so as we run the train, um, and as we run all of the trains, the cars will be put into every spur, every turnout will be used, every locomotive will be used, et cetera. So GMRI operations, when it builds that train, is going to take each car and put it into an industry per the schedule for that industry. So we know that when we get done, GMRI, GMRI operations and the industries and the physical locations of the cars uh, will be all in sync. So we create the train, we rename the manifest to the cut name, hand the manifest to a team member to run the training while checking everything. We monitor processing the cuts and populating the spurs to adjust the balancing in, uh, in the route for the next train going through. We know the J-Ops will not overfill a track. Uh, so that's, uh, at the same time, that's allowing us to double check JMR oper operations to make sure that the numbers it has for the length of a spur uh, are correct. And as I mentioned before, routes can be adjusted. So as a town fills up, uh, or if it becomes uh, as full as you want it to be, uh, you can adjust the route to skip working that town. So after a while, and it took a while, um, we ran all the cuts. And with all the cuts run, yards and staging should be empty at that point. All of the, all of the cars should be out on the railroad in industries. So what, I, what should we do here? It was a great time to clean your track and clean the turnouts in the yards and in the staging, totally empty. We'll check for cars overflowing a track, overflowing a, a spur. Um, sometimes we have a railroad this yard, this large, and you've got uh, lots of guys working. Uh, track lengths will change. They'll put in the building and shorten the spur, et cetera. Uh, so JMRI needed to be updated in a couple of cases where track lengths did change, and uh, we need to reflect that. One of the surprising things that I didn't expect uh, was inventory cleanup. I, for, for several times, I said, who moved this car? This car was in cut 26, can't be in cut 32. What, what's going on here? Turned out we had lots of duplicates. We probably had about 20 duplicates out of our, 20 or 30 duplicates out of our 700 cars. And in some cases, we have multiple duplicates of the same car. Um, so those cars were pulled, set aside uh, for renumbering. So we're almost done. Industry and interchange tracks are full of cars, nothing in the yards, nothing in staging. We need to prepare for a no normal operating day. So we need to get cars back into the yards, get them back into staging. So to do that, we ran one or more complete days of standard trains or selected trains. So these trains would leave staging with no cars and come back with cars pulled from the industries per the J-OPS schedules and the weight tribes. It repopulated the yards, repopulated staging, and went back to, uh, got us closer to rebalancing the railroad for normal operations. We did run special trains as needed to um, clean out some areas of the rail, not clean out, but to rebalance some rail uh, areas of the railroad. So, we then resume normal operations. We started the process of the repopulating of the railroad back in January 22. Took us into March to do the cuts 
And then we ran several sets of uh, standard trains and uh, special trains. And we did the next operating, next formal operating session was uh, in, in August. Summarized process was fun. It worked. Cars and engines were vetted. Track and turnouts were vetted. Duplicate cars were identified. And JOPS issues were fixed. The big deal was that the op railroad was repopulated according to the rules we had built for each industry. And then the railroad was ready to resume normal operations, although it did take a while um, for some industry spurs to achieve a normal inventory count. I mean, when you do something like this uh, in the early stage where you force cars um, and keep putting cars into an industry track and you get them all the cars out of the yard and all the cars out of staging, our industry spurs were pretty full. Uh, so it took a while for that to, to get back to a, a normal normal operation. So that's the presentation. Here's the, the references. Um, this uh, presentation is out on my website, uh, which is the bottom line there, nnrwy at tricksanddesign.com. And I uh, thank uh, Ed Marin for the photos of the railroad. And are there any questions? I uh, I have a question, sir. Yes. On the as as you started to uh, well, started moving trains around, and and problems were discovered. Did you have a separate crew maintenance away and a rip track crew that would immediately go to work on whatever track work or rolling stock problems that you that cropped up? Uh, we didn't. Quite, have it quite that formal, Dave, but uh, mm. basically um, if one of our guys was running a cut and putting things away and he came across a bad turnout, uh, either he would fix it himself or he would ask one of our team members who likes to work on track to fix that turnout. Uh, we would um, pull a car out of a, out of a cut um, and basically fix it right there in real time. We, we wanted to get each cut to stay together uh, and get fixed in real time and then get distributed together rather than trying to, it would have been a lot of, frankly, keyboard work for me to have to keep track of, okay, well, we took this car out of this cut and put it over here. And when is it coming back? And we create a new cut for that. And yeah, I didn't want to do that. We fixed, uh, we fixed the cars. Uh, it, in real time and we clean track in real time same thing for for turnouts thank you so so just so essentially if you think about the railroad then the balance on the railroad is that you have essentially the capability of having all the cars in industries or all the cars in yards so if i kind of look at the overall car capacity of the layout it's kind of double the number of cars you have uh, yeah, so the, the Central Vermont happily had the ability to do that. It had the ability yep. to take 700 cars and, and dump them into industries. So yep. there was a track capacity in the industries and the, in, and the interchanges uh, to do that. Um, if there hadn't have been, we probably would have changed the trains so that it would put it into the industries and the far end staging Right. Uh, no, no. Yep. Something like that. But, uh, um, you know, to keep it simple from my standpoint, we stuffed them all in the industries and then rebalanced after we cleaned the staging areas and the yards uh, and went that way. Because I, I imagine that setting up JMRI for the first time is a challenge with that many cars. Well, yes and no. Um, if you have a spreadsheet, with your cars and that spreadsheet uh you know has got the reporting marks of the car and the location for the car um you can import all of that into jmr right. operations in one fell sweep swoop uh it's the schedules 
right. for each industry, which is the big deal. And we've, over the course of the last, well, over the course of the life of the, of the Central Vermont, um, we've documented every industry, what it does, what it received, what it shipped, all that sort of stuff. And that document has grown to about 50 pages. Um, and what we've done is based on that, I've set up the JMRI schedules for a particular industry. Now, typically, uh, an industry is only going to accept one or two types of cars. Right. And uh, it'll, it, it'll receive a load and it'll ship it, uh, receive a load and ship empty, or vice versa. It'll receive an empty and ship a load someplace. So a lot of the industries may have only two or three rules in, in their schedule. Right. Um, on the other hand, you get something like a team track, and a team track will accept every kind of car and, you know, all kinds of loads and stuff like that. So a team track uh, schedule could easily be, you know, a dozen lines or more. The good news is that you can use the same schedule for each one, for all your team tracks. You can just copy the schedule then. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But what what is key here is um, the use of JMRI's uh, custom loads. So everything we do with these schedules involves a custom load. It might be grain, it might be flour, it might be uh, scrap steel, that sort of thing. And the, the custom load um, is what is probably the most important thing of what car goes to what industry. So um, you set those up. And the uh, the system then runs very smoothly based on that car and that load and that industry. So so what you, so I think what you're saying is to you know to do GMRI you start with what the loads are that different industries need, and then that defines the cars, and then that defines the schedules. Exactly. So so GMRI is is industry oriented as opposed to car oriented. So um, when a when you build a train to leave staging, um, that JMRI will look at the cars in that train, look at the potential loads for each car, and then match an industry to a car that's leaving on that train. So it's not the kind of thing where you've got a four cycle way bill where that car is gonna go the same route, you know, every four times around the railroad. Um, it's the case where you know that a particular industry receives flour, but that flour can come out of North staging on any car. And in fact, will come out of staging on any, any car that is capable of carrying flour. So it just assigns those in staging then? Yeah, yeah, so, cool. so staging, uh, now you can do it, you can run right JMRI without staging, you can run yards and stuff like that, but Normally, well, what we do, we have two large staging areas and a couple of smaller staging areas, but a train that leaves staging will be assigned loads and assigned destinations uh, based on the needs of the railroad. Right. Cool. Well, are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. I know we kind of veered off of the, the, the basic topic there, but I think it's I mean, it's very interesting to see how JRMRI operations was used here. And it's easy to see how creating essentially a virtual structure and moving things around allowed you to, to, to have the software do a lot of the work for you. And, you know, and I have to say there's a bit of Tom Sawyer in the fence here um, with convincing everybody who hadn't been able to operate for two years that, oh, yeah, the right way to do this is not to do it by hand where I have to do a lot of work. The right way is to do it by the computer telling you guys which cars to move. I think that's brilliant in and of itself. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks for everyone and appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, we'll see you later. See you around. Have a good one. Enjoy. Take okay. care. You're welcome to stay, by the way, if you want. But you're uh, I've got family commitments. So thanks, guys. <laughs> cool. So anyway, with that, I'm I'm going to just go ahead and open it up. We've got a fairly small group. Any um, any exciting modeling things to talk about? Any new projects, new builds? Uh, 
I've got work I'm going on now. Phil, I'm curious. Yeah. The club locomotive, there's a locomotive on the ACCRS O scale layout, which is the Western Pacific 3007. Do you know if that locomotive is personally owned or is it a club? club I think unit? it's a club locomotive, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, at some point somebody said, oh, that one's Phil's, and that didn't seem yeah, right. I don't think that was mine. Okay. Well, notice what's missing in 3007. There's nothing inside the shell. Uh, uh, I've been undergoing, un, I've been going through a project of overhauling uh, the club uh, locomotives, uh, some uh, brass, but a lot of plastic models, uh, particularly by the uh, Atlas. And here is, here's a drive mechanism, one of the trucks, and it is interesting how rough um, a duty the locomotives on club layouts that do public shows can get. Um, I'm finding just uh, amazing amounts of wear and dirt. And uh, it's an interesting process. Uh, there is a person at Atlas who's in charge of O-scale parts. And um, we've been, I and uh, Wayne Bryson have been working with him on and off, trying to uh, find out if, if somewhere in their storage they had parts for for the locomotives, and so we're we're just trying to get them back up and running well. Uh, and it's been a an interesting process when you have a locomotive that's 10, 15 years old. It can be a real challenge, and uh, it's. You know, you sort of question your sanity until you get a price for what a new locomotive costs. Not a fancy one. Just a new locomotive without a lot of bells and whistles and O-scale will set you back half a grand. Which at first, you know, I just, what? <laughs> but that's the price of doing business. And the thing is, trying to keep a fleet of motive power up and running is is uh, turning out to be a real challenge. Um, so I've been, been working on that, but I'm also working on another project at the club. Anybody guess what these are? This is a gauge. The turnouts on the layout are also beat to death after 40 years of heavy running and um, an O scale equipment is so much heavier and more powerful that the wear and tear on the turnouts is, is really heavy. But the thing is they're hand laid. That is the, uh, the challenge is, is because they're hand laid. What is the number of a frog? And the reason this is coming up is, is that, Mr. Jay Criswell, who runs right away uh, industries uh, modeling, they model supplies for O scale. And here's one of his products. Okay. Frog, it is yes. a cast frog. Because what I'm finding is, is we are going around the layout trying to fix and improve the track work, is some of the, the frogs beautifully constructed 40 years ago are just worn out. And I, Phil knows I spent many happy hours on uh, crawling around on the layout, hunched over, trying to rebuild frogs in situ in place. And it's not fun. I, I got to tell you, it wasn't fun at all. And uh, so I reached out and have contacted Mr. Criswell He's actually sent me some samples of some of the cast frogs they offer in code 148. And uh, we have a project coming up and it's sort of interesting because the presentation we just saw mentioned that they uh, were going through and spotting problems in the track. And we're doing the same thing in Pleasanton of going through and inspecting the track work, identifying worn frogs, loose frogs, spikes missing, 
bad solder joint, the whole gamut of things that go wrong on heavily used old track work that is, um, what, what's the temperature swing, Phil, there in that building currently? Uh, it goes from, you know, 35 to 37 in the low to probably 120 in the high. Yeah, and, and for some odd reason, long stretches of track work don't like that. So we're having to address all kinds of problems around that. So we are going to be uh, having a work session coming up on the 18th where we're just going to go around the layout inch by inch looking for any of the problems. And this sort of parallels what they've had to do at the central Vermont of identifying problems and fixing them. Although the task is so big, frankly, that I, I hope to lead this and, and on the 18th simply identify the problems not try to fix it because it sometimes it could take an hour just to fix a turnout. You know, you may have to replace the throw bar and re-spike it and re-gauge it. And, you know, you know how time can go when you're working on turnouts, especially old hand laid stuff. But to get a hit list then of, of the different problems and start, you know, working on them, electrical, mechanical, gauge, the whole nine yards. So um, I and others, are, are working hard to try to increase the reliability of the ACCRS Alameda County Central Railroad Historical Society, Phil, is that right? No, just uh, just Railroad Society. Railroad Society. Anyway, so um, that's what I've been working on, um, mostly here at the bench recently, but we'll be over at the layout on the 18th and at uh, and continuing to work thereafter because we've got more shows coming up and we want to get the railroad more reliable, which, of course, was also part of the central Vermont effort is is increasing the reliability, uh, which I'm all about. Um, I'm going to be doing more clinics in the future about increasing reliability, rolling stock in particular. Anyway, so that's how I've been spending my hobby time. Who's got something? Or if anybody has a question for me, like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> I have a question for the group. It's not necessarily you, uh, because mm -hmm. I don't have ever done this. Um, I'm in the process. I've gotten into this new thing of uh, trying to build a reasonably long um SP um, um, Shasta Daylight. And the only cars that you can get for this um, are kits from Union Station. And I got my first one for a 38 uh, seat uh, um, crew um, coach, crew car and coach. And uh, I'm wondering, has anybody in this group had experience with building Union Station uh, HO uh, passenger cars? And if you would, you don't have to tell to do anything now, but but I'd like to be able to, to identify the person and and uh, have conversations. Wow. So you get a core kit, it says, and the sides. And so you have to, yeah, you're not quite scratch building, but you're busy, aren't you? Yeah, I've got the kit. Um, the core, for instance, parts on, on the core. Mm. And um, I, unfortunately, I've got my background burr in and um, the sides in here somewhere. The best uh, thing to do is hold a piece of paper up behind it. Hold a piece of paper up behind it. Do you have a piece of paper? Yeah. So hold a piece of paper up behind it and that way it'll... I understand what you're saying. I just have to get yeah. to the paper. Yep, no, no, I understand. Hmm. 
Yeah, well, maybe the blur won't let you do it. Yeah, they're they're kind of you can see it. Yep. Wow. Anyway, I'm just looking for somebody who's done it to uh, maybe uh, mentor me a little bit on doing it. I'll bet you somebody in in the SP Historical and Technical Society has done so. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to be at their meeting in in um, October in Reno or Sparse. All right. Yeah, there's going to guarantee you there's going to be some folks there who have wrestled that particular bear. Well, I'm going to, I'm putting this appeal out first in this group. Yep. If there's anyone. And then I'll go from beyond. Uh, I'll put it on our website and then maybe on the spgroups.io. Yeah. <sighs> Hopefully somebody has done it. I've been selling them for 30 years here, yeah, so. Who else has something to share today? Something you've accomplished, something that you haven't accomplished or struggling with? Knock, knock jokes, what do we got, anybody? Well, this is a little on the lame side, but I actually started laying track on my layout this week. So that's excellent. A, that's a big accomplishment since I've been it's not lame. That's great. Working on this uh, thing for some time. Uh, if you were at the LD Op Sig meet, I presented the, the layout in PowerPoint back in January, and so. Mm. Uh, at that time, I had, you know, kind of sort of some bench work. And so now I'm actually putting some track down. This is the bench work we see behind you? It is. Let's see. It looks like, what, 40, 42, 45 inch high? Oh, boy. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I could measure it. I'll put a piece of, I can put a, a measuring tape on it. But... Um, it has to accommodate all the bookshelves mm -hmm. and filing cabinets uh, and all of that other shit that goes with a home office, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I built, uh, see, uh, you see all those shelves up there? That's where all my books, uh, where a lot of my books went. I, I built uh, shelves all around the room up high to put all of this other stuff up there to get it out of the way. Is it continuous run or is it a uh, switching layout? Uh, it's, it's a point to point switching layout. Um, it's gonna be kind of a G shape mm. uh, because there's three doors in this room. There's one in the corner over that way um, that leads to the main house and then there's two doors on the wall next to that one of which is a closet and the other which goes to the basement slash laundry room so uh, there's lots of challenges with the space <laughs> yeah uh, I Considered at one point getting a shipping container to put in the backyard, but I figured that a divorce would be kind of too expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's a negotiation that has to be done delicately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I spent so much time over the last few years uh, landscaping my backyard. I really don't want to screw it up. It looks it's a very pleasant place to mm -hmm. sit at now and watch well, the birds and the flowers. And so well, now is 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 the garden railway in the backyard already? Uh, no, there there's not going to be a garden. <laughs> 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 at least not until the HO indoor layout gets done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good timing. <clears throat> I am. Um... One step at a time. Yeah. 
But that's, that leads us to Phil and his layout made out of modules. So anyway, so I was going to just this quick update. I'm, I'm got to take more pictures as I go through the process here. So this is the corner module I, I'm building. So there are modules off this way and over here. Um, but this one here is basically, you know, if you kind of look at the piece here, it's, it's about a little over eight feet long this way and four foot wide this way. And so this is the piece of plywood. Um, you can see it's cut out to this shape now, and I'm starting to cut right here. This level of the plywood needs to be lowered because this water level is about three inches below the, the level of the track here. And mm -hmm. so what I'm doing is I've got basically everything laid out. Mm -hmm. These are fast tracks turnouts that are printed out. And, you know, basically they're taped down, and then I used a, you know, red contractor's pencil to mark where the track locations are and what i'm doing right now is cutting away this part that's going to drop down for where the water and that is that whole area so now i actually it's i need to take a couple of more pictures i've got all the framing on underneath it now so it's basically ready to go and i, I want to lay most of the track from the back here it's going to be a lot easier because this eventually will be against the wall right here and when that's against the wall it's a long way in to get into here to do the track work. So what I'm going to do is do this track work before I put it up against the wall. I got so, to ask you, that's Phil. A smart move, Phil. Yeah, no, it's laying out across two feet to try to get to a place to do track just doesn't make any sense. For operations later, Phil, what's your reach from the operator side to throw turnouts and couple cars and all that sort of stuff? So. Let me throw this. See if this, what happens if I do this? Uh, actually, let me share my screen again. So this is basically the, the layout. Um, what's the, the dark green are the existing modules. This is the module I just showed you is right here. There's going to be a corner module here and then eventually a, a larger piece here. Um, so if you look at the reach here, these turnouts will all be electrically powered. Ah, so the idea is if you're running this train here, you actually run it probably from back here, run it up here and you can run these turnouts remotely from here. Mm. And then you can reach in here to do any uncoupling that you want here. I probably, I'm really looking at how to put some sort of an electrical uncoupling ramp somewhere, probably right up here or maybe right here between these two turnouts. And with the idea that if you stop there, you can do an electrical uncoupling and then push the cars back. Um, that That's a decision I have to make because, you know, there's a lot of ways on the ON30 side, a lot of people have cut, I think I've cut some of my coupler strims off because we typically don't use the electric uncoupling ramp. So, but from here, if you look at the reach, it's about, you know, this, this distance from here is 32 inches. So that's about 24 inches right there. Hmm. You know, you, you might be, you know, uh, especially with that new lighted uh, uncoupling pick that you upgraded. Uh, it might work just to do her by hand. Yeah, that's that's the thought process. And then what I'm going to do is have a panel. There'll be a panel here that will control all these turnouts and these turnouts down here. Mm. And then there'll be a, the same control panel over here on this side. And I think I'm just going to make everything electrical. I, I was thinking about trying to do some ground, doing these as ground throws. Um, you know, this one here and this may and maybe this one here because you can reach them. But I think I'm just going to make them all electrical, um, and that way you don't have to worry about it too much. Now, how so. fancy are you going to get on the electrical? Are you going to use, like, the switch it thing so you can just no. do the controller? No, I think I think my my current plan is to just do a panel and... Um, let me see how this... I, I don't know how easy this is to see. 
so this is this is actually um um free cad mm. and so if you look at that that's a control panel um i don't know how, you, how visible that is in this it's there that man it's a little more visible so this is basically a 3d print that's two millimeters thick and then has the track on it is all the track and lettering is all one millimeter up from that hmm. and then the the place where the turnout switches are is a millimeter up that lets you you can color this stuff pretty easily with a felt pen um and i'll probably print it in white i've got kind of an off white that i i'll use I've used. I, actually, I'm I'm looking at. I'm redesigning this to make this so that these edges here are rounded, and then I can just mount this with screws on the fa as a face plate, versus trying to recess it at all. And these will just be push buttons. Hmm. And then there are two LEDs, and I'm just going to use a switch. It. Um, you know, my decision was uh, that a switch it made the most sense. So, if you look at that area, there are six turnouts. Um, so a switch eight, you know, is a little bit more, you got a couple that aren't used, but I'll probably do all of those from that one switch eight, maybe the two on the other end also, and just run them across there. So that gives me eight turnouts to control. And, you know, the advantage to those is that they're, you know, that you can use DCC control on them or you can use a push button. And, uh, and then they're, you know, latching. The other way to do it would just be to try to do something with latching relays. I've done that before, but it's kind of a bit more work because you got to go develop it on your own. But, yeah, you just want to latch it one way or the other with a push button. And then you take the lights and you run the lights to both places. Hmm. So it ends up being you've got, you know, four wires for a control panel. Kind of regardless of how you do it, you've got four wires that have to run there. Two wires for the switch and two wires for the LEDs. So if you if you've got you know eight, if you've got a control panel that's got eight switches on it, you basically have to run four cat fives. So yeah, it's it's and then you got to figure out it. You know, I, I'm going across. Part of that goes across an aisle, <laughs> so the the control panels won't. So all that has to go across the aisle then are the outputs to the turnouts, and that's and basically what I probably I'm going to do is is do those with the output to the turnout, and then I'm going to take the turnout switches controls and use that with 12 volts to power the LEDs. Because that way you don't have the LEDs trying to be powered off of the switch it. And I and I'll you know, end up I think using tortoises probably. Or I may may look at the MP tens from uh from um TT West. Uh, is that the same thing that Seth Newman offers? Or Seth Newman from Seth Newman's company, yeah. Actually actually, you know, Richard, who was your I don't know if he was here earlier or not, but Richard actually imports them and sells them with Seth. Mm. Kind of like do with the light pick, which the light pick is up on Seth's site if anyone's interested. It's uh, and there's there are all the different versions that we're putting a version up that's got um. And let me if you're if you're interested in that that stuff, let me see. Is it? No, uh, it isn't here. I don't have a picture of it. I um, have but, one on my hand, Phil. Yep. A inexpensive LED flashlight, a uh, come on, the black plastic part is a 3D printed thing that Phil developed, and then it's made to accept a good old bamboo skewer, which works great for HO. And notice it has a very directional beam, so when you're uncoupling, it lights up the spot where the coupler is beautifully. In addition, if you need to read a reporting mark on a car, it you know, and it, it, the lighting isn't good in some spot in the layout, this thing will let you read the reporting marks. And uh, it was based on something that Micromark offered that really wasn't that good, but Phil imagineered this thing 
into a much more useful tool. I have a bunch of them that I have for my little railroad. Good stuff. And you can get it from Seth Newman's. Yeah, so so these are the ones from Seth. Ah. And so basically you can choose the ones that, that David have which has, which uses a, a um uses a bamboo skewer that can be replaced. Um Seth really likes this number sixteen tapestry needle. So this is a steel needle. Um and then these are dental picks. Um and basically, you know, there's a 3D printed collar, and you can get it either in orange, which lights up, or in black, which basically doesn't light up and concentrates the light down below. And what we did is we actually decided because we had a lot of people said so they didn't know which one they should get, so we're going to do so we do a little a bundle that basically is the orange dental pick, the orange um, tapestry needle, and the black um, the black um, uh, uh, bamboo skewer. And so normally these are like, these are 13 bucks and these are 14 bucks, but the combination of the flashlight with a three is going to be like 23 bucks. So, you know, it's pretty cheap on Seth's site, um, especially if you're going there to buy something else and then you combine the shipping. So, um, can you put the website on the groups.io? I will. Hang on. Let me get you the link. The direct link. Yeah, but I, I, I'm not in a position to copy it down right now. So No, no, I understand. I understand. I will get it for you. Wholesale. Yeah. <sighs> I've used the dental pick um, with the, the sort of the, the little furry piece, and and that works very well. Um, unlimited switching that can be done on my layout, which is not much, but uh, I just think of the addition of the light is is so much because sometimes it's just impossible to see where the knuckles are exactly where the little sure. space is and the light. Whether whatever the tip is you're using, having the light right there just is like, oh, this this takes the fun out of it. <laughs> I postulated yeah. that my layout is always uh, uh, seen between 11 a.m. and and 1 p.m. Uh, high uh, high sunlight. <laughs> and mm -hmm. what I don't know. If you've seen that, that. Here, let, let me run yeah, the. Yeah, uh, I'll run this and see if you guys, if you guys are interested. This actually has the link in it uh, as a, as I think it's in here. Introducing the light pick, the best uncoupling tool for model railroad operations. The challenge in uncoupling cars on a model railroad using traditional skewers or other tools is the ability to clearly see the coupler and to insert the tool into the precise position in the coupler to enable smooth uncoupling. The light pick solves this by providing accurate light right where it is needed. Even in dimly lit areas or where shadows between cars makes it hard to see the coupler, the light pick makes it easy to see the coupler and to insert the pick into the precise spot to optimize uncoupling. The light pick comes in three pick options with the 3D printed collar available in black or high visibility orange. The light pick includes an industrial grade pocket flashlight that uses two AAA batteries that are included. The bamboo skewer light pick uses the popular bamboo skewer as the uncoupling pick. The skewer version of the light pick is designed to insert a skewer and hold it in place for uncoupling. The skewer can be replaced if it breaks or if it wears out. The length of the skewer can be adjusted by cutting it to the length desired. Another option is a number 16 tapestry needle as the uncoupling tool. This is Seth's personal favorite. The tapestry needle light pick is made with an extension to put the needle at the right distance for uncoupling. The dental pick version of the light pick incorporates a standard dental pick. The dental pick has graduated whiskers to fit into the coupler and make uncoupling easier. The light pick is made with an extension so the dental pick can reach the coupler. Many modelers swear by dental picks as the ideal uncoupling tool.
Hmm. In addition to uncoupling, the light pick can be used to illuminate car reporting numbers. This is especially valuable in tight spaces like yards. Buy your light pick at Model Railroad Control Systems. Use the QR code to order yours today. Hmm. Yeah. So basically, that was the whole idea. It's pretty cool. So I yeah, never so thought to use a dental pick though with the with the little whiskers. But I'll have to try that. Yeah. It's um so yeah, so what we do is we did these and you know the and the idea and I I said probably gonna end up putting the thing up so people can print it themselves. It wasn't really to make money, but what you see down here, this is the dental pick, you know, kind of what they look like on there. And then this this is not up there yet, but we're gonna put up this bundle for twenty three bucks, which hmm thought it was a pretty cool deal for for people to be able to try all three of them and decide which one was interesting and of course if you're really smart you can buy a couple more more flashlights and have two more so anyway yeah it's neat uh that the deal at, at least I, I don't have to go run around looking for the flashlights or, or, or... yeah and that was kind of the thought process you know it's it's yeah. kind of like almost not worth the effort to go through to find flashlights. And the flashlights, I end up buying them and set there come a minimum of four. So you buy four of them. Yeah. And uh, plus getting a flashlight, there's a zillion of those things on Amazon. And it's getting one that is a certain diameter. So it'll fit yeah. is, is part of the fun. And that's what I mean. You'd have to, you'd have to get, get, guess or, or find out the exact spec. <laughs> If you want to yep. Amazon, but, uh, this would uh, the deal. Hey, such a deal. Such a deal. Yeah. Anybody else been doing some uh, interesting modeling or have something you would like us to look over with you? Now, I have one other modeling project that I've been involved in. Um. And uh, you know, I'm I'm starting to put together a 1950s version of the Shasta Daylight, but also in the um, behind the engine house in Port Costa, there was a um, grounded coach that was used as the um, uh, locker room for for people who worked in the roundhouse and and other support buildings and it uh, um we identified it as an 1885 uh, uh sp coach and i have gotten the closest version that i can from as a wood kit from la belle and i have just finished applying three coats of polyurethane varnish sealer to 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 the 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 wood parts, and so I'm. This is another uh, pa coat passenger coat coach that I'm I'm working on. Um, it, it's been a sort of an interesting throwback to the days of the 1960s model building with wood wood uh, um, wood parts, except that I. You in in the um, La Belle kit, they provide you with a blank end um, for the cellar story um, piece. To you have to carve the end. Well, I chickened out on that and bound and bought found in in, in one of our auctions a couple of uh, um, model die casting Overton coaches. Mm. Any of you be familiar with those for around the Christmas tree? Well, I spliced together uh, the roofs from two of them to make a Sarah story roof with the proper end. Here's the Overton. Yeah. So I you just you just hacked it right across here. I just hacked it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Hacked two of them together and. Um, Use uh, a lot of of, of uh, Tamiya or uh, or this one's um, 
I actually I've wound up using Tamaya uh, plastic putty, but this mm. also the the um, plastic putty from uh, um, Vallejo. Now this coach, when you say it's grounded, so it, it the trucks are off. There's no truss rods. It's just they set the set it on a a foundation or some blocks or something. It's just, um, blocks of wood and. Uh, uh, sometime in the 1920s or, or so, as far as I can tell. And mm. um, we, we identified it and actually found a copy, uh, a picture of, of, of the SP coach uh, in service in the 1940s as a, um, um, a crew car on, uh, for maintenance away. Mm. And uh, Sam Harrison, who did the maintenance of Waybook, helped me find the, the a good picture of the coach. Um, the LaBelle kit has one window too many, but uh, I'll let that go. <laughs> the office license there. I'm not going to try and redo the, the, the sides to, to match because the SP windows were slightly larger in, mm. uh, than the one in the kit. But anyway, it's been interesting to go back and 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 have to do the um, oh, uh, do the poly the vet the varnishing and so forth and sanding of the wood parts. Now, as you're modeling it, has it been painted over with some maintenance away color, or is it just flaking paint and gray yeah. wood? Yeah, it's it's been, been painted in in the barn red that uh, the SP used for um, uh, engine houses, uh, wood engine houses, and mm. uh, 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 any of the support structures for the engine house, such as the foundry and other other things. The um, not so much the foundry as the blacksmith shop that was in back uh, as a separate building. Uh, All right. Some year, uh, about a year ago, I, I built a, a, a proper model, not a mock-up, of, of the blacksmith's shop. Uh, yeah. Now, this is Port, your Port Costa model, right? Port Co yeah, it's Port Costa. Uh, the, right. the, the small engine house and, and turntable and so forth, which I haven't built, um, that, that supported use uh, for helpers to push tra uh, freight trains up up to the bridge the, uh, at uh, Martinez. They needed an extra shove on uh, most of them. They, the, in the S 50s, the SP was running um, all the old cab forwards between Oakland and Sacramento to get the last of the mileage out of them on oh. a level grade area because most of the western division is flat uh, and as you as most of you have noticed except for the grade going up to the bridge hmm. and um and anyway that the, the the they needed a, a, an extra helper and the helpers would actually be covered uh, uh wouldn't be coupled they'd come up behind the caboose and it required a steel caboose for any train that was going to, to do this. And a steel underframe caboose. Um, and then they'd shove it up and, and to the level of the bridge. They wouldn't couple. The, 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 the coupler would be loose at, at, the, at the, the back of the caboose and the, the engine. And they'd go across to Bahia, which uh -huh. switch yeah. on... on um, the Benicia side, and there they they'd wait for a dispatcher and cross, uh, clearance to cross over to the westbound track, and back down all the way to Mar uh, Port Costa. Hmm. But that the helper operation is really what I'm modeling, or at least one end of it, and uh, that was more interesting to me than 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 yard switching. Are you going to put? Are you gonna have a cab forward there at your at Fort Costa in your in your mo on your model? No, nah, I can't fit the whole train on my layout, which is only fourteen feet down. Um, so um, 
I, I don't know if I'm going to uh, find a used cab forward that uh, uh, probably a plastic one from BLI or or uh, in, in a mountain that yeah. not too good and just just have it there sit sit there as a, a photo prop. It, it just makes me sad to think of those mighty locomotives relegated at the end of their lives to pushing, helping push trains up a quarter mile grade. <laughs> they didn't use the cab forwards to push. The, the, the cab forward was assigned as the road locomotive. Oh, okay. You know, um, actually, Roseville, I think they, they went out to the Roseville. Uh, All right. But the they used little 280s. All right stations for the pushers because the, the consolidations would fit the 70 foot turntable at Port Costa. Ah, okay, thank you. Ah. So there was a fleet there. I counted on, on photos maybe 10 of these consolidations uh, sitting in either the shops or the the uh, the, the the ready line at, at when um in 1950s photos. Now that grade starts just east of the Martinez, uh, current Martinez Amtrak station. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, but there was no room for an engine terminal at Martinez. Right. Besides, the SP had this existing engine terminal before the bridge was built. Mm. Uh, it was built originally in the 1880s. Uh, and and lasted until they dismantled the whole thing in 1960. Mm. It's a very fascinating little operation. Ah, thank you. Well, the Port Costa Ferry was the logical place to put it. Um, Lord Port Costa was originally the south end of the ferry. So ah. Um, the Port Costa to Benicia. Up until 1930, they had to put the whole train on a ferry and ferry it back and across the Sac uh, Carquinez Strait. Um, now obviously, a, a, a very in, a intensive labor and everything else, and cost of the ferry and, and everything. Uh, but it wasn't until the 1920s that they got the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to relent and allow them to put uh, the lift bridge over the across uh, the east end of uh, Carquina Strait, what they called Suez and Bay Bridge. Hmm. Now that ferry, starting from Port Costa. Is the existing Benicia fishing pier where the other end of that ferry actually came came uh, in? The, the Benicia side may be preserved. The, the, the Port Costa side was to totally dismantled. You just right. there where the where the ferry piers had been. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you there. I think that the the Crockett Club has has models of both the ferry and the uh, the Benicia uh, the bridge that was actually built to replace it. Right. Oh, I know the certainly I know the bridge. I'll have to look next time I'm there. If anybody hasn't been, by the way, to the club in Crockett, I recommend it highly. Um, it is. I think from what I've seen, my experience in the Bay Area clubs is it is the most modern layout design of all the big permanent clubs in the Bay Area and is the best one for walk around operation in DCC that you really can pick up your train. Incredible club. I don't have the interest to be in a club, but if I were, I'd be in that one. Yeah. They, they've done an amazing job. Their history is interesting, too, for those that don't know. They're refugees. Now, the odd fellows building that they bought, yep. they actually own the building. So there's no problem of some park commission or, or uh, fairground commission throwing them out, as happened up in uh, Roseville. Yep. Well, in Napa, 
they got driven out. But the Crockett guys came from the fairgrounds in Vallejo. And the uh, fairgrounds uh, needed to, felt like they needed to make more money. And so they took, basically just ran them off. But they landed on their feet down there in Crockett. And I think that was a, an amazing feat that they did. And I suspect they worked really hard to make that all happen. I haven't heard the whole story. But it's just great to see a club that refused to go down and actually has created an amazing display there. Oh, and they do have a Lionel layout upstairs. You have the three rail. What, what's the name of that group, Ken? That's there in the upstairs of the build. They're building in Crockett. Yeah, well, it's 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 two levels. Yeah, yeah. but it starts up on the second floor, goes to the third floor of the building. Right. Anyway, and, uh, it, they they modeled all the way from Oakland to the, to the Sierras, and yeah. uh, you know selectively, and uh, um, it it's 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 quite a fascinating uh, thing. Uh, both the 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 Western Division and the and the Sacramento Division. Yes, P. Oh, and and it takes a long time to traverse that railroad because it is huge, <laughs> just huge. I think if you're running scale speed, it's almost an hour to do the take a yes to take 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 the uh, something from Oakland to their uh, uh, Reno Sparks. I think it's called the Carquinez Toy Train Operating Museum. That's it. Thank you, Phil. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 particularly like if you take family with you, especially young persons. That one is a, a crowd pleaser for for young persons and and makes uh, how shall I put it? Wives of our age get nostalgic too. <laughs> yeah, that, there's a second mu uh, layout in there that that's uh, for the toy train stuff, uh, for Lionel and and so forth. Yeah. And, and well done too. And they're actually separate admissions. So you've got to pay twice if you're a visitor. I know I paid for the wrong one the first time I went, <laughs> and had to sort of say, hey, "Wait a minute, my five bucks." <laughs> um, it's for a good cause, Ken. Hey, Dave, that uh, Overton coach. You yes, sir. Uh, who makes that model? Model die casting. Oh, it was model die casting. There are thousands of them out there, you know, in in in, in every flea market. Everybody bought them for to run around the Christmas tree and so forth. As as did I, but then it turned out HO scale under the Christmas tree at this house didn't work very well, so I. Uh, slid upscale to O scale for my Christmas tree. I've got actually one, two, three, four, five. I've got six of these coaches uh, on a future railroad um, when I'm not when I'm not at this house anymore and have room for a layout. I'm going to use it as part of a to a modeled tourist railroad. You know, a rail little railroad museum that runs a tourist railroad and I'll run all these these six Overtons as the uh, the passenger train that the tourist operation will run. You know, if you want scale length coaches for from the eighteen eighties, take two of them and, and you can you can splice them together and, and there you go. They will they will splice. I'm looking at one. Yeah, I, I'm not going to butcher them, Ken. I'm going to stay. Let them let them run at this length. They well, the thing is. Are these Overtons actually, was there ever a prototype for them? Or are they a, a, a um, uh, what's the word I want to use? You know, the, I, thought, the, I thought it was a Sierra Railroad prototype. One of the cars was, was is, is a prototype for Sierra, was, was modeled sort of after a, this is back in the, in the 70s when model die casting and other didn't really want to go out and do true prototype uh, uh, things. They sort of clobbered them together as mm -hmm. what sort of looked realistic at the, in their uh, designers. And um, it wasn't until 
late in model die casting that they built these beautiful palace cars that that are our full um uh, 1890s uh style uh, passenger car uh that are actually i think they're in 70 foot or 80 foot uh length 80 foot length mm, okay but i've got most of a set of them ah here's here they come here they are hey, there there that's what you use now what 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 yeah. are they what railroad are they uh representing them as charles along uh, This has been painted, the roof is painted red rather than the black that they were originally. Mm -hmm. But there is no road name on them. Oh, okay. Ready for decals, so you can, uh, right? <laughs> you can put the, uh, yeah. the letter board any any decal you want. Well, the Model die casting sh shipped them in every fantasy railroad from the Gordy and de defeated Dawn. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm not going to worry about the fact that they're not prototypically, you know, that they don't follow a specific prototype. They're not the right length or any of that. But for the purpose of amusing guests to see the cute little cars behind, uh, uh, I've got a little SP consolidation. And just trot it around and say, "Oh, there's the tourist train coming through," and you know, it'll it'll be a crowd pleaser. For about thirty years of of model die casting, I think they were like a cash cow. Uh huh. Because they <laughs> sold across to to people who weren't model railroaders. Yep. And allowed yep. Them Christmas trains or whatever they wanted, little fantasy railroads. How long are those the cars? Engine I used with them. Oh, okay. I don't know, but two spliced together make a 60-foot car. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not cutting them. <laughs> it's been, in SP's term parlance, it's a 60-foot car, right. but it's actually a 68-foot because they don't they, – they measure between the bulkheads of the passenger section. Right. Not counting the vestibules, that, that engine, uh, Charles, that you showed us, is that a a two four uh, a four four zero? The four four zero. Ah, is with it one the of the? Is this one of the ones with the motor in the tender? No, no, no. It's a Bachman. All right. I think it was the Riverossis put the motor in the tender on those old 440s. Yes, they did. Yeah, with, with, with the shaft that, that went to the drive the, the, the drivers on the. Yep, yep. Oh, we remember those. I just From remember the I understand, the they didn't work that well. That's absolutely right. They did not run well. They didn't work that well, and the shaft always got lost. Yep. Yeah. They're uh, well. They, they they were good thing. That we I think we all those of us that dealt with them uh, learned a lot <laughs> working trying to make them work. When I was working in a hobby shop in the eighties, uh, they they uh, can remember people coming in about Christmas time and wanting to get the shaft. You know, we didn't have any spares. <laughs> didn't yep. Any spares. Uh. And, uh. Rubber hospital tubing was the, uh, yeah. was the or the gas which you used to fill a um, model RC gas car, whatever it was, the mm -hmm. airplanes that that plastic. I think it still get that, but that's what oh, people the, used. The tube, the tubing. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. the tubing. Yep. Yeah, which probably is the same as the medical. Just back then we didn't have access to medical things <laughs> <laughs> now we have a far more intimate relationship right. with med medical things at our age on doesn't it, don't we but yeah. the um the mdc they made four variants of the shorties and i think the the passenger the combine they made a business and they made a uh, baggage those are the four variants and i think that the passenger one was based loosely on sierra Railroad, there's one and two, there's two cars. 
And I yeah. think the, the aficionados said the roof profile was made to look cute. It wasn't accurate. The um, duck, I, you know, so, but yeah. it looks nice. And I think there's also a little bit of a ridge or something from what I remember. They just mm -hmm. make, maybe it was the technology they had at the time where they just made it look nice. I don't know. But then the other thing you used to do was electrify them so you could put lights and then the problem, one thing leads to the other. And then it all of a sudden become a, like a glow stick, right? Because it would mm. bleed through the plastic. So then you would paint the inside black or gray or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so ready-made becomes a little project. Then you want windows that glaze in. And, the thing uh, I liked about these was there were interior kits as well. Yes. Yes. I was going to say oh, that. Oh, really? So they made, and you could still get the interior kits. I mean, the other people that do it nowadays, 3D printed. That I have, yes. I got a, an interior, uh, a set of coach seats, 3D printed. But now Charles is showing us the the real thing, uh, the interior kits from back in the day. Yeah. Yes. All right. The yes. other thing that Model Diecast did is they made this beautiful series of of Harriman cars. Yes. yes. They were only sixty footers long rather than 68 and the reason was not because they they the designers screwed up it's they wanted them to fit in the same boxes that that they <laughs> in. Ah! <laughs> fit in the box oh god well, you know packaging you know Through the box dominates everything <laughs> <laughs> fit in the box can i i can i completely understand that but it's just the practicalities of being a model manufacturer back then where you had to build to a price. It, yes. it turns out that the baggage in RPO are actually scale were, were built to 60 foot lengths. Right. And, and so they can be used um, as is uh, with a, they don't really, the, the, the windows, and doors don't aren't exactly to the to the right position, but they're yeah. good enough for 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 most of us to on on Harriman. And and I have some that I bought oh way back in the the old SP Harriman computer uh, computer cars, nineteen eighties or seventies, mm -hmm. and I still have them in and and and. Now, now they they were lettered with decals from California Locomotive Works. Pete Constantinus is sold uh, um, thing. I used to work wor um, work on his model railroad out on uh, uh, in, in San Francisco uh, for for a while back in in the in the seventies and early eighties. Now those cars though would be easy to splice to get. The correct length. Um, they're not easy to splice. It turns. No. Right. Oh, they, it's getting the right. But but the the, the as I'm saying the passenger carrying cars are the wrong length. Right. Um, the the the, the head end cars. Mm -hmm. Or actually, you notice I I've put correct uh, ventilation ducts on these. Ah, yep. And uh, everything. That's for a crew carrying baggage car. And and then also for the RPO uh, combination, uh, Express and RPO. Hmm. Those are fun. And well, then they run on correct. The, the RPO actually has as um, three axle trucks. Hmm. I managed to avoid all of this, Ken, because my pass my main passenger train is an Amtrak Coast Starlight from the 1980s. So <laughs> I just bought the Japanese-made uh, Kado cars, and and I'm done with big passenger trains. <laughs> I wasted two and a half hours on on uh, last Saturday um, watching a video of, that somebody took from a sleeper uh, all the way from L.A. to Portland. Out, uh, and he had, had really good focus out the, the windows. Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, wherever you were on, on the starlight. The whole two and a half hour video. A two and a half hour YouTube video. I don't know if I'd watch the part where they're in the Central Valley, but I certainly would watch them up around Mount Shasta and, and down, you know, the Cascade line. Yeah. This went from up the coast route. It didn't go ah. to the valley. Oh, okay. This this is this is the Amtrak. Uh, it's about six years ago. Mm. Six, and um, you know, it, it was sort of interesting. It had a lot of interiors, including the dining car and 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 all of that stuff. And they still had china plates at that point, so it, was, it must have been old. Yeah, and. Um, but it was interesting to me because I grew up in Portland and and uh, had a, a, at least one time, several times taken the Cascade go to go back to between San Francisco where my parents had moved and and uh, University of Washington in Seattle. Mm. Ah, to have the money to ride ride passenger trains today, I, I need to win the lottery because it's expensive. It was cheap then. It was the cheapest form of transportation to sit up uh, in the coach. You know, it didn't take a sleeper as a student. Right. And But one time I did manage to catch in 64, the fall of 64, one of the last Shasta daylights because they discontinued it at the end after 65. Um, I had to, it didn't meet with the uh, pool trains in Seattle or in Portland. So, to get to Seattle, and so I had to stay overnight at a college friend's house in in Portland, and uh, I can't remember whether we drove together up to Seattle or whether I took the pool train between Portland and Seattle. Well, we would be disappointed in you if you drove up instead of taking the train. <laughs> Vincent, what if what have you got today to share? Anything? Yeah, I'm. I've got a the the. What they call the three quarter dome, yeah. Jesus, three quarter height, um, on order from Rapido. They're making mm -hmm. it, and the only reason they're making it is because Canadian Pacific has the one of the last ones preserved and has remodeled it into a car for their business train. And the owner of Rapido, of course, in Canada, just is he's, he's a total CP uh, CN fan, and he had to have that car. So he's making the, all, all the, the SP versions. Mm. Yeah. And so it's 170 bucks for a passenger car. Yeah, that's a little stiff. Steep. Vincent, do you have anything today? Yeah, I could share a little bit. So what you got? It's September and getting ready for Christmas. <laughs> so <laughs> no, seriously. So we always wanted to have uh, a couple of layouts around the Christmas tree and traditionally to the one under the tree but i was making one for a corner that has a little hill scene and it's funny you talk about the overtones because I actually was taking out some of the overtones that we have with the four four o's and uh so making a little loop that goes up and down and everything we'll see how it turns out it probably not operational but uh, operational but it'll look nice hopefully ah okay this will be a static display yeah all right yeah, because I was thinking if you say up and down, and I think about no, no, 4 no, 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 trying no, no, to pull no, no. anything up. No, right. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just it'd be totally just just for looks, and then we'll take it to the next level next year. Yeah. But um, the war the wrong time to start thinking about that is November. Yes, better is June, but kind of the summer kind of escaped us. So now, good. You, what? What scale train under are you running under? Oh, the I'm train? all H, I'm all HO. I'm all HO. So, and I do have some of the micro trains which are HO, kind of like on N scale. So, if we ever do turn it to be operational, mm -hmm. we'll have to, you know, maybe that would be better because you're kind of N N scale or N uh, gauge. N gauge, N, right? N, the scale, N, the scale, N scale is HO. The gauge is N of the track. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. So you're talking oh, there's something about called HO -N, narrow gauge. There's you're something right. called HON30. Not, I right. said three. I might have said it incorrect. Okay. HON30, which is more of a European thing. Right. And it's N gauge track, but it's right. HO scale, kind of. I think yeah, it's yeah. a little, I think it's, 
you know, so they don't run really well, but it takes, it doesn't take a lot of space to do something reasonable. May, may I advise no. you to be ready to vacuum a lot? <laughs> yes. I actually had to abandon my HO train under the tree. So uh, that's, that's, the, I'm sorry, I don't interrupt you. No, no, carry on. So that's the problem. It becomes more maintenance than fun. So mm -hmm. I started making little platforms that would go under that's the tree. Insane. You only have to set it up. You never have to go buying for a tree again. <laughs> oh, I see. It's, no, that doesn't work in our house. So that's why I was looking at something on a corner that's not necessarily under the tree. And, right. e and even if it's a uh, larger scale, I mean, we grew up with the uh, standard gauge. That'll take you back a little bit. My father had um, Lionel standard gauge, which is big. Standard gauge? Lionel standard, standard. Yeah, it was... Uh, Standard gauge. Standard gauge. If you if you do any research on Lionel, you always think of O O gauge, right? right. Three rail Lionel O gauge for high rail. Gauge. Yes. Ah, that's it. <laughs> Except oh, look that's, at that. I think that's the one. I think he had one like that. Too. It well still does actually. Um, yeah. So we know everything about uh, and tinsel would short out the track and things like that. So oh yeah, over the years. Now over the you years, have it, the lead tinsel. Otherwise, it doesn't look like a tree. I've never heard of Lionel standard gauge. This this was obviously pre-war. If the yes. car that was that Charles just showed up is any example, I think back I, then, Lionel the prices on it either. Lionel made standard yeah. gauge. Oh. Flyer made what they called wide gauge, mm -hmm. and there was a couple of other manufacturers. It all ran in the same three rail. Mark section. Um, the curves were different. The uh, standard uh, standard gauge Lionel was the same 36 inch radius. American Flyer was the same 40 inch radius. Mm -hmm. That they uh, continued with the O gauges. Two and one eighth inch spacing between the rails. And in those days, a lot of Americans would buy British stuff to run because there was a, a whole lot of it, of English stuff that was available. Two and one eighths. I okay, think now, back then people had. It's hard for me to visualize, but people had bigger houses. Um, maybe it wasn't. Sometimes they would have like use a battery to run the train. That's what I was told. They might not have electrification yet, but they would have space. Mm. They, People who could afford that stuff. That's probably true. That's probably true. Yeah. It's probably also not the general population. It was not the general yeah. population. You have to remember that most people, and even more so then, lived in parts of the country that have those key, key characteristics for model railroading. Basement. Basements and lousy winter weather. <laughs> yeah, so, most Eastern hobby. Yeah, so it I, is, it's, yeah exactly. I, I grew up in New York, and my father, uh, well, he passed away a few years ago, but we still have the collection. And um, he would he would, uh, nice, he would would put it in, um, I'm losing my train of thought. So he actually used it as a child growing up, so it goes back that long. But then over the years, he would acquire more, like most of us do. <laughs> and, uh, and I think there's only one car that he's missing that he never quite got. But other than that, he got everything he was looking for. Uh, and then over Christmas, we would set it up. And we still have it in the basement on the East Coast. Here's a piece. Yep, wow. that's the track. Good that's grief. The track. Look at that. And they had these little bars that you push in. Do you have one of those that to connect two together? There's like a black... Um, yeah... Um, Oh, this, the, uh, when you connect two and together, no, the, and a very the clever locking in, mechanism. Yes, a clip. The clip that comes in under the two ties. Yes. It. it was very yeah, clever I've the way they did it. Those. I've got those also. Yeah. The spring yeah. clips. Spring clips. Yeah, it was very clever the way it worked. So that's so what we grew Lion, up with. Lionel's <laughs> are plain and black, and American Flyer was uh, bare tin. For some reason, he didn't like American Flyer. I think American Flyer was Connecticut and Lionel was New York or New Jersey. And he was kind of partial yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. But around that whole area, he he started probably in the 
like I said, he grew up with it, so he had it all his life. But I think in the 80s and 90s, he started trying to get, because we were, you know, pretty much moving out of the house around that time. He started trying to get uh, more pieces to finish his collection. So The thing that made a, made a problem was that the, uh, the couplers are not compatible. Um, within his set, they are, but he didn't use, you're talking about other brands, American... Yeah. Yeah, I think American. Oh, maybe I'm Gilbert AC Gilbert. Is that right? AC Remember Gilbert. the other? They were American Flyer. I think. Yeah, American I Flyer. think I think those became the successor of S scale. I think. Um, yeah, but so. uh, they were not compatible, as far as I remember. Gilbert made S scale American Flyer. They began as O scale. Oh, yeah. during the war. Yeah. The uh, which war? World War. <laughs> War. Well, that's right, because they were both operating during the first war too. Mm -hmm. But uh, the American Flyer made O scale. Or, excuse me, O gauge, three sixteen scale, and that was what became S S after the war. They went to the two rail, uh, two rail from the three rail. Mm. So in 40, 46, last end of 45, the American Flyer came out with the same 316 scale on two rail track. And they made a big thing about them being the only ones with the two rail real track. <laughs> It, it'd be fascinating. I'm sure somebody's done it, but to do a story about all the innovations back then. Um, well, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, the article in uh, Wikipedia I'm looking at here, it says standard gauge, open parentheses, toy trains, close parentheses, covers some of this history. Uh, the, the com yeah. Some of the competitors and the backing and forthing and trademarks and <laughs> just there was a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. So this is a long way around <laughs> just holiday trains. And uh, yep. I got tired of doing under the tree. Plus, it doesn't really I mean, that's just the maintenance. You have you want to put structures and things like that. And it kind of doesn't work under a tree. So I'm kind of different, a different approach. And it does. every well, okay. It's... I have a I have a twelve inch stand that's eighteen inches square. That goes in the middle of the, the plywood base with the white sheet over it. Put the stand. Tree goes on top of the stand. That gives me about 18 inches clearance under the tree for the railroad mm -hmm. and the buildings and trains and everything else goes under under there in that space and uh and the stout, so, so the stand is higher than the i think i need to take a bio break so yeah, yeah. yeah. don't fall in <laughs> i think it's good i think we'll carry can we carry this over till two weeks from now um, yeah, but it's been this nostalgic. This nostalgic talk has been great, though. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, Vincent and Charles, thank you very much for for bringing this up and showing us. And Charles showing us some of this equipment. I had no idea about this part of model railroading history. Oh, it's, really? It's it's fascinating. It was standard was the big thing. If you were anybody, you had standard gauge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. It was the big thing. Yeah. The word well, big is operable there. The thing is, it says here that Lionel actually went down in size in 1906, 1907, because they it says they were manufacturing two and seven eighths inch gauge line through 06. Yeah. Egad. Well. But that one, that one didn't last. Post-war, everybody had smaller houses. <laughs> Post-World War II. No, yeah. no, no. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
You're competing with the big big manufacturers in Germany. Phil, Phil, hand off to me. Yeah, I've got to take care of the dogs. Have a good one, guys. Enjoy, yeah, Phil, enjoy. make me host. Make me host, Phil. We, we, we can continue chatting a bit more here. Okay. okay. There we go. Yeah. the The thing is, I wanted to say, Vincent and Charles in particular. I have tried. I tried the HO scale under the tree, and the dust bunnies just killed me. At the maintenance. So I'm running O scale standard gauge under the tree with a 24 inch radius. Uh, and again, I'm sort of like Charles. I have a large circle of about 40, about 50 inch diameter half circles that I snap together, has the track permanently attached and has uh, painted white and my wife's craft glitter all over it to look like snow. Mm -hmm. And then the presents go inside the circle. The trees plunk down in the middle of this. And We'd like, to, she'd love it if we have like a Christmas village. And so not at this house, but in the future house, I'm going to separate those two half circles by about three, four feet, a couple of pieces of O-scale flex track length yeah. and just extend it out. And that extension will be where she's starting to think and look about what sort of Christmas type buildings, whether Studio 56 or, or whatever, to have a, a, Chris, a real full bore Christmas scene. So that's where we're heading. But the O scale standard gauge, they, the they, weight and size is, is, uh, is reliable. Yes, Ken. Somebody makes a, a Bedford Falls mm -hmm. from, um, what, what's the movie? Um, yeah, for, yeah, the uh, movie. Um, um, that's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, this yeah, is a scene we or buildings? Yeah, but they make miniatures of the buildings of Bedford Falls to get right. a prototype. Otherwise, you can get Dickens' uh, era of uh, buildings, um, and, uh, mostly in this in class uh, poly uh, material these days. Mm -hmm. but, um, it's a plaster material. Yeah. It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful. Oh, from the movie, it's a wonderful. And life. Bedford Falls was a fictitious town where it took place. Right. And some say it was based on Los Gatos. I find that hard to believe, but mm. <laughs> that's local lore. Maybe some of the scenes were filmed there. Well, I'll but, mention this to my wife. She's yeah. she's she'll be the person that decides. You know, I run the so, train. She she'll be deciding exactly what goes so, in the Christmas scene. I was we, taking a little bit of a different tact and thinking of rather than worrying about the oval that's in the middle or whatever you want to call it. Right. Figure out it's on the side. And mm -hmm. this is progressive thing. Right. And if I said, my wife, oh, I have to buy more trains in order to do this. She's going to say, what? <laughs> no, use what you have. So if we I don't, don't have really have a standard or the S under the tree. Yeah. I'll set up a double loop of. Yeah. Bachman uh, flex track, uh, Bachman snap track, mm -hmm. the 18 and the 22 inch. Right. And I'll run HO and ON30. Mm. And quite often, if I don't use any of my HO or O scale buildings, I'll use the uh, Department 56 North Pole. Ah. They, they, the one thing that frightens me about Department 56 is the price tags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah that, <laughs> but but well, we've since... Got, we've got uh, more than enough to fill the top of the piano. Ah. <laughs> I get the surplus. <laughs> yeah. Well, since my wife is the one who will be selecting what we actually get, I'm, I'm going to, you know, we'll try to stay around O scale. But yeah. as far as particular... You know what particular buildings and stuff she gets is just whatever strikes her fancy past that. So we'll we'll see what we get. I, I had a plastic tree and the uh, the O and thirty works quite well, mm -hmm. and so does the H O. Yeah, I, for whatever reason, I just I didn't have luck with that. But what I did have fun with is I was taking my Christmas train is a prototypically you know pretty correct union pacific uh, sw 1200 but then taking 
tinsel pipe cleaners and hanging them as garlands off the handrails, having a little tiny wreath hanging from the front handrails oh, and boy. all all that sort of stuff. The caboose has um, the same thing, garlands and stuff on it, Christmas lights. And then I took Lionel three rail cars and converted them to two rail for Santa on a sleigh all lit up from MTH, a Lionel uh, dump car, which was loaded with presents. Mm -hmm. And again, tearing the guts out underneath it so I could turn it into a reliable two rail runner. And what I look forward to is we're going to have a show in Pleasanton when the Great American Train Show comes to Pleasanton in, De it's, uh, in December. And I run that Christmas train at the Pleasanton O-Scale layout, and the kids absolutely love it. It is so much fun to run at the show there and the, you know, have it on the layout. You'll, you'll hear the kids go, it's Santa, it's Santa. <laughs> Just can't beat it. All right. Yeah. Oh. Well, I got to go over to the uh, to the old stables then and the, and watch that when when I do the train show. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do do come by because, and, and... Uh, I'm part of the uh, the O N thirty Central California coast. that's running over uh, at the building. That's right. That's right. Yeah, do it, do drop by because I'll be having that Christmas train not running all day long, but you know, bring it out and it's take turns. But right. yeah, you just just you throw something at me and say, "Where's the dang Christmas train?" and we'll get it out there. Mm -hmm. Vincent, anything else, Ken? Not related, but I'm running fiber in our house. So <laughs> oh boy, what fun! <laughs> So part of the fun of doing this is, you know, you tend to run, we have a two-story house with an attic, mm. and you tend to run the wires in through areas where you normally store things. So I find a lot of these things that we're talking about right now, trains and stuff that I haven't looked at in a while. Yep. So it's actually yep. kind of nice. It yes. Uh, and maybe I'll get out one of those LaBelle kits. <laughs> so. There you go. Yeah. Just before my one one last thing on the LaBelle. If, is it? Christmas night. Well, oh, sorry. I just got to finish the thought in LaBelle. They also had rounding, roof rounding kits, like a template or something you use in order to make the, uh, that's what I remember doing. Getting the shape right. Yeah. Yeah. And also right is subjective because that's why they didn't pre-do it. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I was told. Because the shape is a little different depending upon if what you're modeling. Right. But they, they made a template that you would glue down it seemed like it was more work than it was worth but and you could shape it anyway that's yeah it. ken you've you've got the last word i think yeah. what <laughs> what you no you're done okay every yeah. gentleman a pleasure going pleasure. down memory lane here and yeah. uh charles i'll look forward to seeing you at the show in december all right you guys have a Thank good you. day today a pleasure yes, have a good one guys Okay, bye-bye.